We will begin our story of the great 17th century composer, Antonio Vivaldi, not in his native Venice, but curiously enough, in Germany. It is the beginning of the 20th century, and musicologists are looking over vast piles of old music by Vivaldi? No, by Johann Sebastian Bach. For Bach had only just begun to be recognized as a great composer. Among the music on earth was a mass of manuscripts reading 12 Concerti of Vivaldi, elaborated on by J.S. Bach. Vivaldi, who pray tell was Vivaldi? And why should the illustrious Bach be so interested in him? For Vivaldi, even more than Bach, had been forgotten in the centuries since his death. The Renaissance of Vivaldi may be traced to this chance discovery. Since then, scholars have been hard at work to reconstruct both Vivaldi's life and his music. Even today, we don't know where he was born. But one thing is certain. He was a fabulous composer, a great musician. He wrote almost 500 concerti for an enormous variety of instruments, 50 operas, sonatas, chamber music, and vocal music past count. And what fanciful names. La Stravaganza, La Cetra, Il Cimento dell'Armonia e dell'Invenzione. What was it like to compose in the days of the royal courts in Italy? What kind of man was Vivaldi? Well, Vivaldi was a famous name in Venice, and Venice was the center of art in the days of the middle 17th century. It was two Vivaldi brothers who had sailed around the Cape of Good Hope in 1291. Why, a Vivaldi had been Doge, or chief magistrate, in nearby Genoa. Antonio's father, Giovanni Battista, was a musician. In fact, he played violin at the Ducal Palace of San Marco. But this particular branch of the Vivaldi family did not occupy a very exalted position in Venice. Antonio's two brothers were in trouble with the police occasionally, one for impersonating a nobleman and the other for wounding someone with a dagger. Antonio was probably born in Venice in 1678 or 1679. He was a frail boy with long red hair, a large arched nose, and, from some reports, a fierce temper. He was chosen by his father to succeed him as the musician of the family, and it was from him that Antonio received his training on the violin.
Then in 1703, the official church records inform us that Antonio had become a priest. Shortly after this, he was appointed musical director at an interesting school in Venice called the Seminario Musicale delle Ospitale della Pieta. This was a school for homeless girls, which was supported by the aristocracy of Venice. Antonio was to be music master there for 40 years. He had already shown great talent, both as a composer and a violinist. Apparently, someone thought that Dom Antonio was a little too talented because some nasty stories reached the ears of the cardinal. It was said that while saying mass, a musical theme occurred to Vivaldi, who walked off the altar in the middle of mass and did not return until he had written down the theme. When called to an accounting by the cardinal, Vivaldi replied that the story was completely untrue. He had been forced to leave the altar by an attack of asthma from which he was to suffer all his life. Because of this melody, he was excused from saying mass. Vivaldi, who was a pious man, greatly regretted this necessity. As the music director of Pieta, Vivaldi was expected to not only direct its musical activities, but to play violin and organ, compose for any and all occasions, and purchase all necessary musical instruments, and see that they were in working order. It must have been a full-time job. It was about this time that Vivaldi acquired the nickname by which we still know him, the Red Priest, because of his red hair. The work was exacting, but it gave Vivaldi all sorts of chances for experimentation. He would compose a concerto for oboe one day and one for flute the next. He even found time to be an opera impresario in nearby opera houses. Here is a section from one of them, La Ninfa e il Pastore, The Nymph and the Shepherd. For a while, he was writing an opera a month. A contemporary wrote of his fantastic speed in composition. Vivaldi can compose with all its parts faster than a copyist can copy it. As to his skill as a violinist, a fellow musician wrote, Vivaldi performed a solo accompaniment admirably, and at the end added an improvised cadenza that can never be equaled. It was played at unbelievable speed.
his compositions were beginning to make their way outside of Italy too. Much of his music was published in the Dutch city of Amsterdam. One of the first sets being Lestro Armonico. Here is a concerto for four violins and orchestra which forms a part of this fine work. You'll remember that Bach, who was a great admirer of Vivaldi, arranged Concerti of the Red Priest. One of them was this concerto, and we now hear the Bach arrangement for four harpsichords. Vivaldi's most famous work was Il Cimento dell'Armonia e dell'Invenzione, The Battle of Harmony and Invention. Four of these concerti are known as the Four Seasons. Each one is prefaced by a short sonnet or poem by the composer himself, describing the seasons of the year. The music is programmatic, that is, it imitates the chirping of birds, the harsh tempests of winter, and so forth. Thus, we can see that Vivaldi was one of the first composers to write program music, long before the days of Franz Liszt or Richard Strauss. The first season Vivaldi described in words and music was spring. Spring has come, and joyfully, the angels greet it with their happy song. Dance nymphs and shepherd near the loved hearth to celebrate spring's bright return to earth. The summer. In the torrid heat of the glaring sun, languish man and herd and burning pine. The cuckoo bird calls, and soon is heard the song of turtle dove and goldfinch. The autumn. Tis the season which invites all living to the sweet delights of peaceful slumber. Hunters with their horns and guns and dogs at dawn's first lightning sally forth. The prey takes flight and the chase is on.
winter. Trembling with cold amidst the silvery snow, beaten by a horrid glacial wind, we run, stamping our feet at every pace. Quiet, contented days by the hearth we spend. Cetra, the lyre, was dedicated to the Emperor Charles VI of Austria. It too is a set of violin concerti. Vivaldi apparently enjoyed Vienna with its pomp and circumstance. The Emperor, who had made him a cavalier and given him a gold medallion, asked him to stay at the Austrian court, but Vivaldi gratefully declined and returned to Venice. By now, he was really a famous man, much in demand for his violin playing, his operas, and his concerti. The Pope sent for him and was pleased by the Red Priest's violin playing. Also, Vivaldi was a great inventor of musical styles and so became widely imitated. He traveled widely to Germany, to Holland, Rome, and finally back to Vienna, where late in July of 1741, the Red Priest died. It is a pity that we know so little of this curious man who years before Bach helped to enrich the world with his fine music.
On February 17th, 1653, there was born to a wealthy family in Fusignano, Italy, a son who was to become the father of modern violin playing, and what is more important, a great composer. His name was Arcangelo Corelli. family were famed throughout Italy. Mathematicians, poets, politicians, soldiers, all of these are to be found in the family lineage which the Corellis claimed could be traced back to Noah, but never a musician. There are so many stories connected with Arcangelo's boyhood that it is all but impossible to separate fact from fiction. They tell of how the boy was smitten with the violin at a tender age and how he would walk miles in good weather and bad to visit the family priest, who was his first teacher. There is even a story that the Pope himself, in Rome, heard of the prodigy and summoned him to the Eternal City to play before the throne of St. Peter. Be this as it may, it is certain that Corelli was a most talented youngster. His studies took him first to the town of Lugo and finally to the great city of Bologna where he applied for and was accepted by the famed Accademia Philharmonica as a full-fledged member at the age of 17. Only two other composers were ever accepted for the Academy before their 20th birthday. One was Mozart and the other was Rossini. He had many fine teachers, among them Giovanni Benvenuti. Corelli was to spend four years in Bologna studying his lessons. In 1671, we find him acting as a violinist at the theater of Tordinona. This theater was run by a certain Conte d'Alibert, who was connected with the court of Christina, the former queen of Sweden. Christina was to become Corelli's patron when he was to come to Rome to live. It was in 1675 that Corelli finally moved to Rome. We can trace his rise in Roman society. In 1675, he was number three of four violinists at the church of St. Louis de Francais. His salary was one and a half. Next year, he was second violinist. In 1679, he was conductor for the Teatro Capranica. By this time, he was generally considered to be the finest violinist in Italy. Renaissance. All the noble houses of the city vied with each other in the presentation of the arts, 
and of all of the arts, music was the best loved and most lavishly patronized. The Pope himself held musical soirees. Once, his patron Christina entertained the British ambassador to the court of the Pope, and Corelli led an orchestra which numbered over 150. Cardinal Panfili employed Corelli for a time as his music master at a good salary. Corelli came to live in the Cardinal's great palace with his servant and also brought with him his friend, Matteo Fornari, a noted violinist who was to be a firm friend of the composer. Then on November 17th, 1689, an event took place which was to have a far-reaching consequence on the life of Corelli. Pietro Ottoboni was appointed Cardinal by his brother, Pope Alexander VIII. The Cardinal's ruling passion was music, and no sooner had he been installed in his home at the Palazzo della Consellaria than he summoned the great musicians of Italy. Corelli's name was high on the list. The Cardinal was to be more than an employer to Corelli. He was to be a fast and sympathetic friend. In his home, Corelli was to find peace and quiet he so badly needed to compose, for he was a careful, fastidious workman. All of Corelli's music is contained in six sets of music. Five sets of trio sonatas, that is, music written for three principal instruments with the violin predominating. The Sonata di Chiesa, or church sonatas, were intended to be played during the ordinary of the mass. They were scored for violins, cello, and organ. The other type was known as sonata da camera, the chamber sonatas. These, as opposed to the church sonatas, were meant to be played in the home. In addition to being gayer in tone, they dispensed with the organ and substituted the harpsichord instead. Finally, Corelli composed the set of 12 Concerti Grossi, Opus 6. These are perhaps the pinnacle of his art and were finished only shortly before his death. 
You are now listening to the Christmas Concerto from this set, one of the best known and loved of all of Corelli's works. became the friend of many of the world's great composers, including George Frederick Handel, who was also to write a set of 12 concerti grossi. Curiously enough, also to bear the opus number of six. Alessandro Scarlatti and Bernardo Pasquini were numbered among his acquaintances. He was to travel to Germany, and it was not long before all of the musicians of Europe were saying what Rome had already said. Arcangelo Corelli is one of the foremost violinists and composers of the age. In 1690, a group of brilliant men of music, arts, and the letters gathered in Rome to form a new society called Arcadia. It was dedicated to the improvement of the arts, and naturally, Corelli was one of its leaders. The idea can be gleaned of Corelli's importance, not only in Italy, but in far-off Germany, by the fact that a false report of his death was somehow spread. The Prince of Dusseldorf wrote to his agent in Rome, lamenting the fact, only to be told that the report which was spread of the death of the famous virtuoso, Arcangelo Corelli, is absolutely false, for he is living at the court of his eminence, Cardinal Ottoboni, where he daily gives proof of his talent. It was for this same Prince of Germany that Corelli was to dedicate the Concerti Grossi. He had worked long and hard at them. They were to be his last works. In 1712, 
Corelli fell ill, and on January 8, 1713, he died. He was buried with full honors by his patron, the Cardinal, who caused the following tablet to be raised over his tomb. For his excellent qualities of mind and incomparable skill in musical rhythms, he was eminently dear to the Supreme Pontiffs, the celebrated musician being long since acknowledged among the members of the Cardinal's household. He lived 59 years, 10 months, and 20 days, dying on the 8th of January in the year of salvation, 1713.